In part 3 of this LMDH origin series, I'm going to cover the only chassis supplier so far that's already building cars for two separate brands, Cadillac and BMW. Coincidentally, it also celebrated its 50th birthday this year. This video's topic then is the Italian Dallara. Dallara Automobili was founded in 1972 by Giampaolo Dallara, a graduate in aeronautical engineering. Prior to setting up his company, he amassed an impressive resume having worked for almost all the major Italian supercar brands like Ferrari, Maserati and De Tomaso. He really put himself on the map when he worked for Lamborghini and designed the chassis of what many call the first supercar, the Lamborghini Miura. The creation of his own company was mainly to go racing, which started with the Dallara SP1000, a small sports prototype with an unusual center seating layout. Because the rules stated that at least one passenger seat had to be present, Giampaolo decided to put two passenger seats on either side of the driver, the exact same layout as the McLaren F1 would have some 20 years later. The car was a success, having won its first race at the Varado racetrack located right across the river from Dallara's headquarters. It eventually evolved into something more aerodynamic and spawned the Group 5 sports car Dallara 1300 and 1600. A first link with the car brand was made when Dallara took a little Fiat X19 and turned it into the Dallara Iscuno Nove, a souped-up engine and totally different suspension turned the little Fiat into a pocket rocket. It also caught the attention of Lancia. They also wanted to enter Group 5 touring car racing, so they tasked Dallara, together with Abarth and Pininfarina, to create something for them. The end result was the Lancia Beta Monte Carlo Turbo. It was a very competitive car and Lancia got themselves a new ally, as Dallara helped create more Lancia racing cars with the Group 6 LC1 and the Group C LC2 in the early 80s. In the meantime, Dallara had started building Formula 2, Formula 3 and Formula 3000 cars and kept doing so until they found it was ready to step up to the top spot of open wheel racing as they would make the cars for the BMS Scuderia Italia F1 team starting from 1988. This cooperation got off to a rocky start however, as the true F1 car wasn't ready for the first race of the season in Brazil and to qualify for the Constructors' Championship, the team had to be present at every race. A temporary solution was found by taking their F3000 car and somewhat crudely sticking Cosworth DFE V8 in it. It obviously was too slow to qualify, but worked as a stopgap until the true F1 car was finished. Just like the Ligier video, I'm going to keep the rest of Dallara's open wheel involvement short. Also like Ligier, there's just too much to talk about, as Dallara has been making cars for almost every imaginable open wheel series in the world for years. This includes, but is not limited, to countless Formula 3 and 2 cars, including the current spec, the Japanese Super Formula cars, all generations of the Formula E car, together with Spark Racing Technologies, the HRT and Haas F1 cars, a total of 8 different Indy cars, including the current chassis that has been in use for several seasons, and many more. The list goes on and on, and will continue to do so. With Dallara's vast armada of open wheel cars out of the way, let's get back to their sports car and prototype racing history. In the early 90s, Dallara got tasked by Ferrari to help with their return to top-level prototype racing. Ferrari had been out of the game for 20 years now, as their last car was the 1971 312 PB. Dallara was responsible for quite a lot of the new car, including the suspension, gearbox, bodywork construction and aerodynamics. Ferrari then completed the package by supplying the engine, a slightly detuned version of their current F1 engine. The 333 SP was born. Throughout its almost 10 year long racing career, the car competed in over 140 races and won 56 of them. Closely related to the 333 SP was Dallara's next Ferrari project, the F50 GT1. The extensively modified F50 was reportedly even faster than the prototype that came before it, but eventually never competed, as a last minute rule change made the car obsolete and Ferrari had no desire to pursue the project further and instead refocused all their attention back to Formula 1. The rule change that made the F50 obsolete did however cause Dallara to pack a new deal with a different manufacturer that did want to continue racing in GT1 class, that being Toyota, who tasked them and their German-based European arm Toyota Team Europe with developing a car that would walk the line of legality, the Toyota GT1. A car so ahead of its time that when GT1 class folded at the end of the 1998 season, the Toyota only had some minor modifications done to race in the new prototype-only GTP class. Next on the list of high-profile brands to work together with Dallara was Audi. What initially started as the R8R, a reliable car for Audi to somewhat test the waters of prototype racing, eventually evolved into the all-conquering Audi R8. 
Developed together with Juiced Racing, the Audi R8 is now seen as one of the best endurance racing cars of all time, having achieved numerous victories across the world, including 5 24 hours of Le Mans victories, 4 of which back to back. The R8 reigned supreme for several years up until the diesel era started with the R10 TDI, which the Lara was also involved with, but to a lesser extent. One thing that should definitely be mentioned was the R8 party piece in pit stops. Audi and Dallara had designed and made the car so that the entire back half could be easily removed. This resulted in entire gearbox changes that took less than 5 minutes to complete. During the dominant Audi R8 era, Dallara had also created the SP1. The intent was to make an LMP car of their own and focus on selling it to privateer teams. Chrysler, who just stopped racing the Viper SRD10, was interested in prototype racing and joined the project in the development phase, which led to the cars initially running as the Chrysler LMP and with the brand's own Mopar V8. That deal only lasted a year though, as Chrysler lost interest in prototype racing after only one of the four Chrysler LMPs managed to finish the 2001 Le Mans 24 hours, some 24 laps behind the Audi R8. Oreca, who also helped in the creation of the SP1, bought the Chrysler cars put reliable Judd V10s in them and continued racing the cars for a couple of years. Dallara's next true prototype racer, excluding the DP01, would be the 2017 LMP2 class P217. Dallara had seemingly lost their touch a bit as the P217 had an inherent design flaw related to the splitter. In short, the car was the fastest LMP2 in a straight line, but arguably the worst in the corners. A 2018 EVO kit somewhat solved the problem, but still wasn't enough to compete against the LMP2 King, the Orica 07. However, the DPI car for the American IMSA series based on the P217 was the complete opposite. The Cadillac DPI VR won on its debut at the 2017 Daytona 24 hours and went on to dominate the rest of the season, so much so that the 6.2 liter V8 had to be significantly toned back with BOP to give the other cars a fair chance of competing. Still, even nerfed, the Cadillac ended up being the most successful car of the DPI era with 27 wins to its name. Given Dallara's vast race car history, it's easy to forget they have some serious road car involvement as well, lately with their own model, the Stradale, but also with the KTM Crossbow, Lamborghini Huracan and most noteworthy, a car that needs no introduction, the Bugatti Veyron. It's easy to see how Cadillac decided to continue with Dallara for the next era of DPI and how BMW decided to pick them for their return to top-level prototype racing. Dallara has been involved with several era-defining cars across their 50-year long history. Chances are they'll end up making some more. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe if you don't want to miss out on the next one.